bad for his church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... What you have just seen is called the rapture. What is the rapture, you ask? To a believer and student of the Bible, the rapture is a glorious event which God has promised to the church. The promise to return and remove and snatch up His church, living and dead, to heaven and deliver them from the time of judgment and tribulation that will come upon the earth when God's wrath is poured out on a rebellious and unbelieving world during the end times. To the unbeliever, the rapture is a preposterous, convoluted fantasy that is right up there with UFOs, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster. Sadly, even many Bible-believing churches also refuse to believe and teach what is clearly taught and even promised in the Bible. Often, these are the same churches that also teach what is called replacement theology, which essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. Adherents of replacement theology believe that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have specific future plans for the nation of Israel. So, the prophecies in Scripture concerning the blessing and restoration of Israel to the Promised Land are spiritualized or allegorized into promises of God's blessing for the Church. There are two key passages in the Bible that speak about the rapture. They are 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. For the Lord Himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And also, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. The rapture is an event foretold in many parts of the Bible, particularly in the New Testament. It is an event that was not only talked about by Jesus Christ, but by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, and the Apostle Peter. The rapture is an event in which the Lord Jesus Christ descends from heaven in the clouds and, with the sound of a trumpet, calls from the earth all of those who have chosen to put their faith, hope, and trust for eternity and salvation in Him. You won't find the word rapture in the Bible, but neither will you find the word trinity. Yet, with careful examination of the scripture, we find that both are clearly explained. You also won't find the word Bible in the Bible, but we all know that it's the Bible because that's the modern-day term we have come to call the Word of God. The term rapture comes from the Latin word rapio, which means a snatching away. The rapture, then, is the time when the Lord comes in the clouds of glory, bodily, to take out of this world all who have died in Christ and those who are still living as believers. A Mystery Everyone enjoys a good mystery, including the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
the Apostle Paul teaches us about the sureness of the resurrection of every believer from the dead. He also teaches us that our bodies will be changed, transformed into a wonderful, eternal, and immortal body. Paul declares that our new bodies will bear the image of the heavenly, verse 49. And in verse 50, he explains why we need the new bodies. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Now let's examine 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57 very carefully, so that we can receive the full extent or impact. First, we will not all sleep, that is, die or pass away, but we will all be changed, all believers, not some. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, suddenly, violently, a twinkle of the eye has been measured by scientists to be about one thousandth of a second. When Paul uses the term in a flash, he uses the Greek word atmos, from which we get our atom. The rapture will take place in the smallest division of time, one atom of time. The dead, that is believers who have already passed away, will be raised or resurrected, imperishable, eternal, indestructible. And we will be changed, receive our new heavenly bodies. For the perishable, earth dwellers or humans, must clothe itself with imperishable, eternal, and indestructible. Old Testament Proof of the Rapture Both the Old Testament and New Testament contain scripture describing the rapture and even record several different occurrences of people that were raptured. The rapture is not a new idea, as some would suggest, but had occurred even before the time of Jesus on earth. The First Rapture In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we read the story of a man called Enoch. The Bible says Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Genesis 5, verses 21 through 24. So right in the very beginning of the Bible, the first rapture takes place. One moment, Enoch is walking around on the earth. The next moment, bam, in the twinkling of an eye, he is standing in heaven before God. The New Testament book of Hebrews even backs this up. In Hebrews 11, 5, we read, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being was taken up, he was pleasing to God. Elijah Elijah is often seen as the first of Israel's post-law prophets. He will make some kind of visitation during the tribulation, Malachi 4.5 and was joined with Moses as the two from the past who appeared at Christ's transfiguration, Matthew 17, 3. Like Enoch, Elijah was translated to heaven without dying. 2 Kings chapter 2 records this interesting event with an emphasis upon the mode of Elijah's transportation to heaven. 2 Kings 2, 1 says, He was taken by a whirlwind to heaven. In 2.11, the whirlwind is further described as a chariot of fire and horses of fire. No doubt this was an appearance of the Shekinah glory of God, since Hebrews 1.7 says, And of the angels, he says, He who makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. God objectively marked Elijah as a genuine prophet by identifying him with the glory of God and his rapture to heaven. We can see a pattern developing. Enoch was raptured before judgment, while Noah remained and was preserved through the judgment. Elijah was raptured, while Elisha remained behind. New Testament Examples of the Rapture The Disciples 
From the New Testament we read, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. John 6, verses 16 through 21. One minute they are in the middle of the sea, and then all of a sudden they were on dry land. Jesus just raptured the entire boatload of disciples from the stormy sea to their intended destination in an instant. Jesus Christ Revelation 12.5 speaks in the form of a symbol that represents the important aspects of the career of Christ. Within this picture, Christ is called the male child, who it is said was caught up to God and to his throne. Revelation 12, verse 5. This picture looks back at the ascension of Christ that is described in Acts 1, 8-11, where Christ ascends to heaven in a cloud. Thus, because Revelation 12, 5 uses the word for rapture, this means that Christ's Acts 1.11 ascension is viewed as a rapture, a trip from planet Earth to heaven. Philip Philip, who was snatched away by the Spirit of the Lord after evangelizing the Ethiopian eunuch and found himself at Azotus, Acts 8.39 and 40, which is located in what we today call the Gaza Strip. Philip was not taken to heaven, but was physically transported from the Judean wilderness to the modern-day Gaza Strip area. Paul Twice Paul mentions that he was caught up or raptured to the third heaven and received visions and revelations of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 12, 1-4. Paul's heavenly trip reminds us of Isaiah's throne room commission, Isaiah 6, 1-13. Perhaps a rapture was involved in this incident. Paul, via rapture, received a commission, message, and revelation that became the foundation for the unique purpose for the church during this age, which in other generations was not known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Ephesians 3, 5 The Apostle John Revelation 4 Verses 1 and 2. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. The first thing John saw when he was transported into the third heaven was the very throne room of God Himself. When we are raptured, the first person we will see will be the Lord Jesus Himself, the King of kings and Lord of lords, coming in the clouds of heaven. However, if we die before Jesus comes back, the first thing we will see will be the very throne room of God Himself. In chapter 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation, John describes what heaven is like. While Paul does not reveal what he saw, John does. When we read what John writes, we are taken out of our time and into an eternal dimension, where time, as we know it down here on earth, no longer exists. In that realm, we will be living in the past, the present, and the future all at once. We will be able to comprehend eternity as God sees it. Rapture of the Church This is the most well-known rapture in the Bible to the average Christian. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Of all the raptures in the Bible, this is the first time that our Lord will take a large group to heaven in a single instance, without first facing death. 
This is such a clear teaching in the Bible that even those Christians who do not emphasize the rapture as a distinct event merge it into the second coming in some way. Yet this is the event that will take place before the seven-year tribulation. Two Witnesses Reminiscent of Elijah, the two witnesses during the tribulation are summoned into heaven in the cloud. Revelation 11 verse 12 Certainly, these special, divinely commissioned and protected messengers fulfill the role as ambassadors for our Lord to the Jewish nation during the tribulation. Along the same line, the male child is said to be caught up or raptured to God and His throne in Revelation 12, verse 5. The Bible provides us with several citations of the rapture of individuals throughout history. This provides a strong support that a group the church, will be raptured in the future, as 1 Thessalonians 4 teaches. Some opponents of the rapture seek to suggest that the worldwide disappearance of millions would be too odd to consider a realistic possibility. Such is not the case if the Bible is the criterion for establishing possibilities. In fact, the Bible reveals a significant number of raptures, or trips directly to heaven, that provide assurance that God can and will take millions at one moment in time. Are you ready for the rapture? So, who will be raptured? All believers will be raptured. The Apostle Paul did not use the words most or some when revealing which believers will be changed at the rapture, but instead with perfect clarity proclaimed by God that, Behold, I tell you a mystery— We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So the bottom line is, your ticket to the rapture came with your membership in the church. It's part of the inheritance you were guaranteed when you first believed, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And your membership in the church came as a result of your belief that Jesus gave his life to pay the penalty for all your sins and rose again to show that his payment was sufficient. Romans 10.9 As soon as you believed that, you became as righteous as He is. There's nothing you can do, good or bad, that will ever change that. Romans 8.38 and 39 So if we're all as righteous as God, how can some deserve to go in the rapture or gain entry into the kingdom while others don't? They can't. The rapture will be mystifying, and to some an inexplicable phenomenon, but it will not be a secret. It will happen before the eyes of a stupefied planet of left-behind earth dwellers. This declaration that Jesus will call his church to be with him seems audacious to many, but it didn't seem so to the Apostle Paul. He was quite confident, even adamant, in his prophecy concerning the mystery that had been given by the Holy Spirit to instruct all believers down through the age of grace, that is, the church age. The defining thing to consider in thinking of the two diametrically different views of the rapture and second coming is wrapped up in the term thief in the night. The Apostle Peter again uses this mysterious term, first used by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.2. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3.10 Peter is saying here that the day of the Lord, that time when God and His Christ, His Son, take over this fallen planet, will begin like a thief in the night. It will be a sudden, catastrophic break-in upon a world doing business as usual. Matthew 24, 32 through 44 Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, 
nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. How can we be sure all this will happen? Even Jesus anticipates a certain degree of honest doubt, for at this point in his discourse, verse 32, He breaks off his description of the last days to give three powerful guarantees that all he has said will actually come to pass. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you'll know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. This is the first guarantee. It is another pattern from nature which illustrates the point he wishes to make. Everyone knows that when the trees begin to put forth their leaves, it is an infallible indication that summer is near. Some have misread this to mean that the fig tree is a symbol of the nation Israel, and that the Lord means to say that when Israel shown signs of life as a nation, that then the end is near. Of course, that is perfectly true, but that is not what he is saying here. Luke tells us that this is not only about the fig tree, but also of all the trees. Luke 21, 29. What the Lord means is that as history unfolds and it becomes apparent that the world is heading toward the conditions he describes, then men can be very sure that his coming is near. The trend of world events is the guarantee that he has been telling the truth about the future. History will confirm his predictions as it unfolds. When the world reaches the stage he describes, and the possibility of the coming of the lawless one looms on the horizon of current affairs, then he is near, at the very gates. We are now nearing the end of 2,000 years of history, and each man can judge for himself whether or not the world is approaching these events. The Indestructible Generation Then the Lord offers a second guarantee, contained in an often misunderstood statement in verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. Many have wondered exactly what he meant by these words. Did he refer to the generation to which he was speaking, the disciples and their contemporaries? Or did he perhaps mean the generation which would be alive when the events he predicted will begin to be fulfilled? If that is what he meant, he would have been saying that when these events begin, they would be completed before that generation would pass. Each of these meanings has been suggested as a possible explanation of his words. But the truth is, he meant neither of these. Of course, if he meant the disciples' generation then his words have long ago been proven false. And the second explanation involves a very forced and unnatural meaning of the word this. The only other alternative is that the word generation means the Jewish people. This people will not pass away till all these things take place. The indestructible people. It is almost certain that this is what the Lord meant for he used the word generation in this very sense in the previous chapter, Matthew 23, verses 33 to 36. He was speaking in severe and sharp tones to the Pharisees, and he said, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, 
some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all this will come upon this generation. The Lord surely did not mean by this that the Pharisees and their contemporaries would bear the blame of all the injustices of the ages. No, he meant that Israel was the nation chosen to be the instrument of God, to teach the world what he is like. When Israel failed, it became culpable for all the dire results that failure brings. It is the nation which was in view when he used the term, this generation. Throughout 20 centuries of dispersion and persecution, a most remarkable demonstration of the truth of the Bible has been the Jewish people and their uncanny ability to survive as an identifiable race. Despite the long centuries of hardship and cruelty, they have proved to be an indestructible people. That fact constitutes proof that what Jesus predicts will surely come to pass. Surer Than Sunrise The third assurance Jesus offers is his own infallible promise. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Verse 35 How much value do you give to what he says? This is the one who came to open blind eyes, and he did. He declared he would give his life as a ransom for many, and he did. He said he would rise again from the dead, and he did. Now he says he will come again. Can you believe him? What is it we count on today as the most dependable thing we know? Is it not the continuity of events? We count on tomorrow's sun to rise, on there being a future. We lay out our plans on that basis. But Jesus says that will stop, will pass away, but his words will not. His coming, then, is more certain than the most certain things we know of. The word by which all things were called into being is the foundation upon which he rests his statement, My words will not pass away. Unpredictable Timing At this point in the discussion, there comes a definite break. The Lord has completed his outline of the events during the end of the age, but he has said very little about its beginning. Now, in verses 36 to 41, he brings that remarkable event before the disciples as the dominant point of emphasis. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one is taken and one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one is taken and one is left. As we mentioned earlier, some have confused this coming with the glorious manifestation of His presence described in verse 30. But the first sentence of this section makes clear which aspect of his presence the Lord is describing. He states most forcefully that this coming will be completely unpredictable. But of the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. This unpredictable element is underscored heavily in the additional warning he gives the disciples in verses 42 to 44. Watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the householder had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It would be impossible for Jesus to use these words if he were referring to the coming in power and great glory. Before that event occurs, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. 
Who could miss that? Who, knowing the scriptures, would not expect the return of Jesus after such dramatic events? But to his disciples he says, The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is clearly, then, his coming as a thief in the night. It is his coming for the church, the unsuspected treasure of earth. He will come to take it to himself, and the world will have no inkling that this is about to occur. As he has just said, we can know that the time is drawing near as we observe the predicted pattern taking shape in the affairs of men. We can see the attitudes that he says will prevail in that day beginning to emerge as the dominant philosophy of the day. But we can never know the day nor the hour. Even the angels do not know. Nor did the Son in the time of his earthly limitation, but only the Father. Men seem to display an urgent passion to set dates for the coming of Christ. Several times in history it has been announced that Jesus Christ would return on such and such a date. Some fanatics who believed these reports sold their property, donned white robes, and went out to sit on some hilltop and wait for him to appear. The whole subject of the return of Christ has been cast into disrepute by such foolish actions. God has maintained an inscrutable silence about certain matters, and this is one of them. The day nor the hour is clearly marked top secret. Just as Jesus told the disciples after the resurrection, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Acts 1, 7 The activity Jesus wants to encourage is not date setting, but readiness. Business as Usual Jesus makes even more forceful this totally unexpected character of his initial coming by comparing it to the days of Noah in verses 37 through 39. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away so will be the coming of the Son of Man. There have been many attempts to make these words, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, to indicate signs of evil things in the affairs of men. Eating has been taken to mean an increase in gluttony through the earth. It is, of course, true that one of the signs of middle age is to grow thick and tired of it, (laughs) but this is not a sign of the times. Also, drinking has been taken to mark an increase in alcoholism and drunkenness, while marrying and giving in marriage has been made to refer to the rocketing divorce rate. But there is no thought of this in the mind of our Lord. What He is saying is, life will be going on as usual. Men will eat, drink, and marry just as they have always done. It was like that in the days of Noah before the flood. Life was going on in an ordinary fashion. Moral conditions were bad, there was violence and corruption throughout the earth, but they were not worse than they had been for quite some time. The point our Lord makes is that they did not know until the flood came. There was no sense of coming disaster. This went on despite the preaching of Noah for 120 years, during which he faithfully warned his generation that God would judge the world of that day. And despite the familiar sight of the huge ark that was built a long way from any ocean large enough to float it, men must have laughed and called him Crazy Noah. But life went on as usual, and the first sign of any coming disaster was the quiet, almost unnoticed removal of a select company from the world of that day. Noah and his family were told to take the animals and go into the ark. God shut the door of the ark so that Noah and his family, eight people in all, were separated from the world. Then a full week went by and nothing happened. Noah, his family, and all the animals were in the ark for a week, and during that time the skies were blue. The sun shone, men went to work in the morning and came home in the evening. Lovers strolled hand in hand as they had done for centuries. Babies cried, men ate and drank, and rose up to play. Life went on as usual. Then suddenly, clouds began to form. The skies darkened. 
the earth began to heave. The bottom of the sea raised, and great tidal waves came crashing across the earth. The skies poured down untold tons of water for forty days and forty nights. All those who lived in the world of that day went down with a bubbly groan, unwept, unhonored, and unknown. So the Lord is saying that His coming at the rapture will be as a thief in the night. Jesus Christ will come stealthy, without warning, and a select company will be removed from the earth. That event He plainly described in verses 40 and 41. Then two men will be in the field. One is taken, and one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One is taken, and the other is left. A Selective Removal The event will be highly selective, distinguishing between two people working side by side. Further, it will be worldwide, for Luke tells us in chapter 17, verse 34, There will be two men in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. While men work in their fields on one side of the earth, others will be asleep in their beds on the other side. But simultaneously, both in the day and the night, the great removal will occur. From human experience, we feel there is only one way to leave this life. We entered it through the door marked birth, and we will leave it through the door marked death. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord showed Peter, James, and John that there is another way by which men could go to glory. He was suddenly transfigured before their astonished eyes. His raiment began to glow, and he was a different person, yet the same Jesus. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It is an event simply unexplainable in natural terms, but there can be no question about the clear language Scripture employs. As Paul told the Thessalonians, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. There are some Bible scholars who take the Lord's words, one is taken and the other left, in a somewhat different light. They feel the ones taken are not taken to glory, but taken in judgment during the tribulation, or killed, while the ones left are left alive to enter the kingdom following. This, they say, would be more in line with the illustration the Lord uses of Noah's flood, where men were swept away by the judgment of the flood. But several severe objections appear in this opinion. First, no one was left behind in Noah's flood. They were all taken in judgment and there was nothing selective about it. The only ones who survived were Noah and his family, who were taken out of the flood before it began. Second, the word the Lord uses for taken is a different Greek word from that which is used for the effect of the flood. That is one word translated swept away. Third, the picture the Lord draws is one of a sudden unexpected removal, and is quite a straining of that picture to imagine execution as always occurring in that manner during the tribulation. Fourth, if the Lord is not here describing His coming for the church, then we have no description from His lips of that tremendous event. All we would have would be His promise, I will come again and will take you to Myself. John 14.3 Because of these objections, it is much more plausible to view this passage as our Lord's clear description of his coming as a thief in the night, accomplishing a silent resurrection and transfiguration which will take the true church out of the judgment of the tribulation, as Noah and his family were taken out of the judgment of the flood. To this vivid description of the silent departure of the church, the Lord immediately adds a word of admonition. Watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the householder had known in which part of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched, and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, 
for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Notice carefully his argument here. He says that if the householder had known when the thief was coming, he would have watched and prevented the robbery. That is, if a man knows he is to be robbed at night and knows the very hour in which it will take place, he will be ready for the burglar when he comes. No burglar sends a notice ahead of time of his arrival, but if he did, he could count on being met by a reception committee. When the robber arrived, the householder would be ready. So Jesus says, Since you do not know when the Lord is coming, then keep ready all the time. Be always ready. Surely that does not mean we are to gaze skyward all the time or fold our hands and sit down to wait for Him. Why didn't He take me? If you are watching this video after the rapture, you need to realize that you have been left behind. At this time, you may be feeling rejected by God. You might be saying to yourself, Why didn't he take me? Or, I don't understand. I've led a good life. The problem isn't that God rejected you. The problem is that you have rejected him. By not committing your life to Jesus and by declining to follow him, you have left him with no choice but to leave you behind. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Matthew 7, verse 21. Why it has happened. Believers in Jesus were taken out of this world to spare them from the great wrath that has just begun to befall the planet. Jesus' return for all his true believers was just a prelude to his final second coming. The second phase of Jesus' return is to set up his kingdom on earth. Jesus' kingdom is why this whole thing is happening. You see, we have come to the end of one age and will soon be beginning the age of Jesus' glorious reign right here on earth. But first, God has to deal with rebellion, sin, before setting up his kingdom. God's going to use this intermediate time period you now live in to pour out his wrath on mankind for its continued refusal to accept his lordship. The time you live in is called the tribulation. Is there hope for me? You may have heard people say, because we've missed the rapture, we are lost forever. That assumption is totally wrong. The only way you can find yourself eternally lost is by receiving the mark of the beast on your right hand or forehead. Barring that, as long as you have breath in your lungs, you can gain salvation by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. John 6, 37 Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 28. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1 12. According to Revelation, a huge number of people will be saved during the tribulation. Some scholars have predicted that tribulation believers would grow to outnumber the saints that were just raptured. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Revelation 7, 9 And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation seven fourteen. Why do I need Jesus Christ to be my Savior? To be allowed to pass through heaven's gate, you need to have all your sins removed. The only industrial strength cleanser strong enough to thoroughly remove sin stains is the blood of Jesus Christ. You could say heaven is much like the clean rooms where computer companies make their microchips, and sin is like any dust or dirt that might try to find its way into one of these rooms. 
The manufacturing process for microchips requires clean rooms to be absolutely spotless, with virtually zero free-floating dust or dirt particles that could damage the delicate microchips. Because humans are naturally contaminated with all kinds of dirt and dust particles, whenever workers enter into one of these clean rooms, they need to wear a special suit that prevents them from giving off particles. To prevent heaven from becoming contaminated with sin particles, God has long set the requirement that anyone desiring to enter into his untarnished dwelling place needs to be covered by the blood of Jesus. The sin decontamination process is very simple. You simply ask Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for it. First, admit your sinful state. Next, ask Jesus to forgive you of your wrongdoings. Finally, make Jesus Christ Lord of your life by surrendering your will to Him. By dying on the cross, Jesus made it possible for each of us to be granted a full pardon from the punishment of eternal damnation. The reason so few people accept this pardon is that they don't think they need a Savior, or they want to find their own way of salvation. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow Me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. What you can do. Now you may be asking, God, why didn't you tell us all this before the rapture so we could be ready? Well, he did. The Bible clearly teaches that God never pours out his wrath without warning, for he is a just and loving God who does not wish that any should perish. That is why God provided the Bible, the good news about Jesus spreading across the planet, and the many signs alerting us to the fact that we were living on the threshold of the tribulation and soon return of Jesus Christ. God gave the world every possible chance for 2,000 years to repent of its rebellion and return to Him. But it's not too late for you to be with Jesus unless you've taken the mark. You see, this story has a happy ending. Jesus' return at the end of the tribulation means great joy to those who love Him. Jesus will cleanse the world of evil and the damages from His wrath and restore the planet to pristine condition. Jesus will rule from Jerusalem over those who throughout human history have put their faith and trust in Him. Revelation 20, 4 through 6 and 9. You can be one of those people. Whether you die in the tribulation or not, it is where you end up eternally that truly matters. Everybody who does not accept Jesus as Savior during the tribulation will go to hell for their rebellion. Anyone who accepts Jesus as Savior, though their earthly bodies may die during the tribulation, will then live forever in glorified bodies with Jesus in His love and glory. Remember Jesus' promise in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Pray now for forgiveness from your sins and ask Jesus to be the Savior and Lord of your life. Don't delay. Of course, if you are watching this video and the rapture has not happened yet, you still have time to ask Jesus into your heart. Don't delay any longer. There is no guarantee of a tomorrow. Ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life right now. Don't be left behind.